sorry, if the lighting looks a bit different, it's because I needed to take a break after that. Um, but yeah, so my daughter finally gets moved to a government hospital. We're all breathing a little easier. Um, but it does not get better immediately after. Uh, after basically like within the first week of her at the government hospital it was just like not great news after not great news after not great news and I just so I finally like cause I don't know I think it was something like maybe I was just trying to figure out if, if there was something I could do while just waiting and then also at the same time I think I was just scared and I wanted to be ready for or if anything were to happen to her um, so I did like start asking my dad <laughs> about like how do we go about you know having funerals for babies and we don't know these things right because nobody wants to talk about it nobody wants to have these conversations and honestly I don't really know the answer either so but because like you know the conversation was kind of cut short but I asked him like so kalau like if it happens, how do how do we go about it? Do we like do we have to register her birth and then register her death? And then he just like kind of told me like I don't want to have this conversation right now. She's still in the hospital, which is good for me because he was like I don't want to have this conversation because she's still in the hospital. We don't know yet. And this was after like I had broken down in my room because <laughs> I was just so. I think that was when like. Because the first few days, I was just so sad. And then now, I was just scared, you know? Because like, we, at, up to that point, had, like, her doctors had done everything they could to get her out of that place, you know? And it just felt like, what if even that couldn't help her? But, you know, thankfully, it did. <laughs> So she was on dialysis for a couple of weeks. At one point, her BP dropped um, significantly because I went to see my husband and he he looked really bad. He was really sad and he's like, I need to go for a walk. And I went in and I just started praying over her. I just started rubbing her back and talking to her and singing to her and I kept saying like you know it's okay I know it's hard I know it's so hard but you're doing such a good job dear you're doing such a good job okay and you still need to come home so every time because I, I had posted about it on Instagram and people were always saying like just call her home always call her home so that's what I did I always like dear Bali okay dear my Bali like come home dear you're coming home okay baby I'm waiting I'm waiting for you at home so I was telling her this, so for what? Yeah, so for two months, I went almost every day <laughs> to go see her. Um, other than when I was waiting to get my vaccine, like my first shot of the vaccine, because in Malaysia, like by the time pregnant women could get vaccinated, I was already too far along. So I just had to wait until I gave birth. And then I, but thank God, I got my vaccination appointment two weeks after I gave birth. So I had to wait um, until I got my vaccination because that made my family feel a little bit better because they just didn't want anything to happen to me at the same time. So we went and then um, we would go every day and I would just talk to her. And like at that time I was still pumping so I would go into the other room and pump and cry. And it was just the weirdest thing and I will go home and pump and cry. And my birthday is on the 30th of July. She was born on the 12th. So 18 days later, I celebrated my birthday without her, which was not what I thought would happen. Like my baby sister came into my room and she gave me a kiss while I was pumping. And she said, happy birthday, Isha. I love you. And she just left. Like, then she went back to her room and I just broke down. I just started crying so much and my other sisters called me like video called me and my mom came in and I was just crying so much and they were crying with me and they were telling me it's okay you can cry you know this is hard and everything and I was like yeah because you know I thought I didn't think that was what was going to happen I thought I would get to be 
with her on my birthday. I thought she would be at home at least with me on my birthday. But my sisters kept reminding me, you know, like she's still here. She's still here with you on your birthday. She's just not at home right now. And that grounded me a little. Uh, so, Alhamdulillah. Then she was there for three weeks on her dialysis. And it was basically the same thing. We would go and but like like pray for her and pray above her and sing to her and talk to her and we just tell her stories about what we did, who we were, what we did. And on my birthday, this was the best thing ever because she was on morphine or like she was on like um painkillers a lot and that made her go to sleep. But when I went there on my birthday, she opened her eyes and she was wide awake the whole day and she was just looking at me and every time I spoke to her, she would blink and she would, it was like, it was like, I've never felt that before. I have never felt that before because it was almost like this little thing that literally just joined us like a month ago. Not even a month, like 18 days ago. Knew me better than I knew myself. And she did everything that, it was almost like she did everything for me. She was awake for my birthday. She was reacting to me for my birthday, you know, and it was just, it was just so loving, like, she really is such a loving little girl, like a loving little baby, and I love her so much. Yeah, and then, it was, I mean, the news would come in, like, the doctors would come in to update us, like, yeah, it's basically the same, yeah, basically the same, here, her numbers are basically the same. Like we were waiting for her platelets to go up, for her clotting factors to go up, because that would inform a lot of other things. And we were also waiting for her liver numbers to go down and her kidney numbers to go down because that would tell us like how she was doing. Because your liver is a self-generating organ, things you learn. And like the kidneys, as long as if she was on dialysis, like a lot of the weight was taken off the kidneys. So we were just waiting and it was the same thing almost every day until one night because when we first got in the doctors they explained to us you know like in the PQ because when she went to the government hospital she was put into the PQ so the doctors explained to us that here we take it one day at a time everything is one day at a time um, and we like you can come and visit her anytime you want but we would suggest not to come at night because you know it's just not much happens at night you won't get many answers and like if anything ever happens we will call you <coughs> so I said okay um but well, sorry so I said you know, it's like don't come at night basically and they said um you know we'll call you if anything just so like just if you don't get a call from us that's a good thing and then um, one night, I'm not even sure when, uh, but I think a month in, um, like no, three weeks in, she, uh, we get a call at night. Like suddenly I'm bathing, it's like 10 o'clock at night and I'm bathing and my husband comes into the room and he's freaking out because he's like, they called me, they called me and I didn't pick up in time so I have no idea do I call them back, like they called me. and. Just as I was about to figure out what to do, they called me, they called my phone and I pick up and I'm like, hello, yes. And the nurse, usually the nurses are very like straight to the point. You know, they tell you like, yeah, baby's fine. Um, we just need more diapers or we just need more uh, medication or we just need more uh, breast milk. But this time the nurses said, okay, uh, can you hold on a second? I'm gonna pass you to a doctor. And my heart, my heart sank into <laughs> my heart sank into my ass because I already we had never gotten a call from them at night and then suddenly the nurse is passing the phone to a doctor and the nurse and the doctor called and said like yeah so we just wanted to inform you that um, she <coughs> she the needle that was in her heart in her neck fell out and she lost a lot of blood but we're gonna not reinsert it because of all the blood that she lost and we're gonna see how it goes tomorrow. So the specialists are gonna call, uh, are gonna see you tomorrow and they'll like explain further on what happened and like what is the next step. 
the next step and I was like okay but is she okay and they said yeah she, we managed to stabilize her she's okay and thank god so we went the next day and it was a Sunday <laughs> We went the next day, it was a Sunday, and all her specialists were there, her kidney specialists, her liver specialists, her in her ICU, like her PQ in, like intensivist doctors, um, her geneticists were there, like they were all there in the room waiting for us and like to explain everything. But what was insane to me was when we entered the PQ, because it's a huge PQ, right, it's a government hospital, so it's a huge PQ, so when we enter the room, we enter on the opposite side and then we turn and we walk towards her. And I remember we entered and we were both so afraid. We didn't know what it meant. We didn't understand anything. So we entered and then when I turned, I saw that there was urine in her urine bag. Because up until then, on the dialysis, it was red. It was deep or deep red. But this time, it was like a dark yellow and I was like that's urine and that and I immediately was so much more optimistic my husband did, did not see that by the way so we go into the room and the doctors are explaining like so her kidneys have been able to urinate on their own and we're gonna keep with this we're not gonna reinsert the needle unless she really needs to but we think that she can do this on her own now and that was <laughs> That was something that we were all very happy about, you know, and I thank the doctors for coming in on Sunday, like on such short notice, but they really took care of her, they really cared about her, you know, like, they really were so sweet and the nurses were so sweet, the nurses, like, because we went up to them and they were, some of them were there at night and some of them had heard of what had happened to her and they were just so kind, they were like, mommy, She's a fighter, she's so strong, like, this one's a real fighter, this one, and like, I still remember to this day, one nurse, one kaka, if I can share her name, I will, but I don't know yet, but <laughs> she was like, she's a miracle baby, mommy, this one, you have to believe it, she's a miracle baby, and I think at that point, I was like, yeah, <laughs> like, if anything now, I can't deny that, you know, I have to give her, I have to give it all up to her. So um, yeah, then after that we just continued with whatever medication they had her on and you know she was, she had to go through all kinds of, that's what it's called, <laughs> blood transfusions, she had to go through, she like almost every day in the beginning at the government hospital she had blood transfusions, platelet transfusions, they did this thing where it's called like, I forgot but like they gave her immunoglobulin transfusions and they like had to take the toxins because basically the liver had like pumped out so much toxins into her body into her bloodstream that they needed to like replace all the blood in her body with like all these blood transfusions and everything so every day we saw and she was so small and she always like had these needles in her so every time we wanted to hold her we couldn't because she was also still intubated so it was great, so everything started looking great, like, you know, her kidneys were working better, she was peeing better by herself, um, her liver functions were looking better, she was getting more and more awake, like, sometimes when we were there, most of the time when we were there, she was still asleep, but sometimes she would, like, wake up and just look at us, and, like, she would just look, like, look at the room, like, she's, until today, she's such an observant baby, you know, like, she really just stares at you and looks at you. And then, um, so we, we just continued with it. And then suddenly one day, when we went there, like I went there first, and the doctor was very worried about her because suddenly one of her lungs, her left lung had collapsed. And they weren't sure why. And they wanted to do a, <coughs> a scope into her lung to see what was blocking the, the path of the airway. And then they found like there was this mass in her lung and that was what was causing it. So I was like, why would there be this mass? And they were like, it could be um, something that happened. Uh, something like, because you know, she was bleeding um, because of her low platelets. So it could have been like, you no, know,
the open wound that never really healed properly, it could also be like maybe it was the tube and, uh, irritating her on the inside but they even they couldn't say for sure what it was and to them it was really weird because they had never seen something like that before so to them it was really worrying like until today that her intensivist there one of the professors is like always asking me like how are her lungs like are her lungs okay because it was so out of the blue and it was pretty bad her lung had collapsed so they took a little bit um, like they did a scope and then they did a little bit of a biopsy to see what it was and um, after that they thought like maybe she would need an MRI to see like what is happening and everything but I think you know we in Malaysia we look down on the quality of doctors we have but oh my god were they insanely intelligent here like at this hospital if I can say anything from my own experience they were insanely intelligent, they were on the ball, they were empathetic, they were kind, they were so sweet. And when this happened, instead of like putting her through all these things, they were like, we're gonna try this out instead. So they put her on a different ventilator, which was like a softer one meant for babies. And they said like, hopefully this will clear out her lungs. And true enough, it, like over the weekend, her lungs cleared out. and. Like they said like so we'll just keep her on this until her settings get low enough then we'll move her back to her normal ventilator and then we will take her off of that ventilator and we'll see how she goes like they wanted to put the CPAP machine on her so okay at this point I'm so antsy because like you just as you just when you think it's over something else comes in and that was what happened to us almost every week you know, almost every week, like just when you think we're done with it, something else came in. Uh, so finally, after that, it got much easier. It was really fun, and like one day, it was really cute because the nurses had um, moved her, but because we didn't know, so they were doing like a little surprise to us. Like we came into the NICU, <coughs> the PQ. We came into the PQ. And the nurses were like really quiet. Usually like they look up or they will like just like nod your way. But this one, the nurses were like really just staring at us. And we were, so I didn't think too much about it. But usually we turn to the right and we'll see her immediately. But this time we didn't see her. So, <laughs> and I was there the day before and she was right there. And my husband was in there the day before. So he like after we couldn't find her, he like spun really fast at me. He's like, he, and his face was just like, what's going on? And then a really sweet um, medical officer, like one of the doctors, <laughs> came in from behind us and she was like, Oh, yeah, Adi has been moved to over here. And the nurses just freaked out. They're like, Allah, don't, why did you tell them? We wanted to surprise them. And I thought it was just so, so life affirming. You know, like after this whole journey we've had, and for them who work with sick babies day in and day out, you know, it was so, it was so, it was so, it was funny and it was sweet. And it was like, it felt like we were family, you know, it felt like they really cared about us as much as we cared about them. And like, they cared about Dia as much as we cared about her. Like, you don't, you don't play jokes with people you don't know, you know, you play jokes with family, with friends. And I felt very accepted at that point and it felt like we were a family and I think that was the moment that I really I really appreciate them like obviously appreciate them for taking care of my daughter for answering any questions I had for like you know not answering questions if they weren't sure and like waiting for the doctors to come but it was just I always appreciated them uh, and to this day so uh, yeah and then and then yeah so we were waiting and they said one day like they're probably gonna change her to the CPAP soon so we didn't think much of it we were like okay like if they change her to the CPAP then the doctor was like yeah so if she manages to be on the CPAP she can go up to the ward and we were like what? because up until that point we weren't allowed to hold her and we weren't allowed to stay the night so we couldn't be with her more than a couple of hours you know because also at the same time there were other babies there that were sick and you just don't want to take up space from other grieving parents.
parents, you know. Um, so they finally were like, yeah, so we're going to try it out. So then I think the next week we came in and they were like, there were so many doctors over her and so many nurses, but they were, but it was a different energy altogether because we've seen that before and the energy was so not great, but this time it was like, oh, we're putting her in the CPAP, we're putting her in the CPAP, we're seeing, and then the doctor came and she was like, yeah, so it looks good, we think it looks good, so we're going to see how it goes. Because everything, and I understand, you know, like as doctors, you don't want to give good news when you're not sure. And you don't want to give bad news when you're not sure. So everything is a we'll see. Which after, like at this point, two months, I'm like, yeah, sure. So we go and we sit down. And then suddenly the nurse is like changing her diaper. And the nurse looks at me and says, okay, mommy, like uh, get ready. Because after this, you can hold her, okay? And I was like, what? What do you mean? And she's like, yeah, you can hold her. Because now that she's on the CPAP, like you can hold her. And I just got up and walked out of the PQ and my husband was like, where are you going? Don't you want to hold her? I was like, I want to hold her but I haven't eaten lunch and I want to eat lunch so that I can hold her for as long as I want to and I don't have to put her down until like they tell me to, you know, so I can hold her for as long as I want to and I don't have to like suddenly get up to eat and then come back and hold her again. I want to just hold her. So he was like, okay, so we went downstairs. I didn't even buy like proper food. I just bought a ton of fruits like papaya and dragon fruit and I ate that like my husband can attest for how fast I ate and he was like wow you're really excited I'm like yeah I'm excited I get to hold my baby <laughs> you know like two months I waited two months to hold my baby so and then he was eating like normal food and I told him like yo I love you but I gotta go and he's like yeah go ahead go ahead so I go up and it's the sweetest thing you know because the doctors, you can tell that it was just as important to the doctors and the nurses that I got to hold her. Because the minute I got there, the doctors were like, Oh, okay, mommy's here, mommy's here, mommy's here. And the nurses were like, Okay, okay, mommy, you sit here. Mommy, so they got me a chair and they are like, Mommy, sit here, okay, mommy, okay, you have the baby, okay. So they put her in my arms. And I just start crying. I just start crying and I'm like, Hi, baby, hi. And she's got... I always say she's got such big little eyes, like, I swear, like, you could see the whole universe in them, and they were just staring at me, like, as if, like, as usual, like, she knew, she knew me, and she knows me better than I know myself, you know, and she was just looking at me, and the, like, I was just staring at her, and suddenly, like, I look up, and everybody is gone. There is nobody around us. It's just me and her. And they had closed the curtain so we could have a private moment. And I was just there. And I called my sisters and my mom. Um, like, I FaceTimed all of them at once. And, like, they didn't know what was happening until they figured it out. And they started bawling. They started freaking out. Like, then my younger sister called me back because she was just like, I can't believe it. And she was just on the phone. She didn't speak to me. She was on the phone crying. But she helped me take like some lovely pictures of the first time I get to I got to hold Dia, and her body was so small because she had lost weight <laughs> because she wasn't getting the nutrients she needed. Like they were trying their best, but you know when you're really sick, your body can't hold in food or milk, so she was vomiting a lot. But they they still managed to give her nutrition, and they were. Yeah, they gave her so much time. I think I held her for like three hours. I'm not, I think so, I'm not sure. But like, you know, then they would, the nurses would come and they would like, is this your first time holding her? And I'm like, through tears and like snot and everything. I'm like, yes. And like all of this in a month, I'm like, yes. Then they're like, oh, okay, mommy. And they would just leave me alone. And it was just so beautiful. So every day after that, I rushed to the hospital. Like, not even rushed. I was just like skipping, like, Yes, we're going to the hospital to hold my baby. And it was, it was so good. Until like, one day the doctor just looked at me and said, Okay, so tomorrow she can move to the ward. I was like, what? Tomorrow? They were like, yeah, yeah, I think tomorrow can, you know, like, uh, yeah, tomorrow. Then he just started talking about this, what's going to happen in the ward, da, da, da. Because in the ward, we could stay with her. Um, we could do all kinds of, like, you know, we could take care of her, I could change her diaper, bathe her, I don't know, like, I could ch put clothes on her. And he was like, yeah. And I was, so then I asked, like, 
when do you think she will be able to come out of the hospital? Then he said, mm, let's say Christmas. We'll see Christmas. If she gets out before Christmas, that'll be great. So at this point, two months later, it is September. So I was like, okay, Christmas is not that far away. In fact, it's closer than I thought. So sure. So then, oh no, it started raining. So if the sound is too much, I'm sorry, but I'm almost done. Um, yeah, so then the next day we moved into the ward. I had to do a COVID test. She had to do, no, she didn't have to because she was already in the hospital. But uh, I had to do a COVID test negative so I could stay with her. So I stayed with her and I changed the diaper and I got to take off my mask. My daughter, up until that point, had never seen my face because I couldn't take off my mask because I was really worried. About, like I was really worried about like anything I might have passing to her, and also like you know she was so sick. I didn't want any germs on her. Like so, it's not even COVID. Like just the random man's flu. I didn't want to give her, and so I, like that was the first time I could like look at her and smile at her, and talk to her and sing to her and have her in my arms and like feel her little fingers against my skin and it was the best and we just stayed there in the hospital it was I know it's not the usual way to go about things but it was a beautiful way to go about things um, so she stayed in the ward for another two months we took turns going in and out because only one person was allowed to be with her all this by the way, all this was when COVID cases in Malaysia were at its peak. And I'm talking about like 20,000 20, and above. So I'm just grateful that we even got to go see her and that we got to be with her every day. And that, you know, we took our, we, we really followed SOPs and we were really serious about it. Like I hardly went out. And then like the cases started slowly going down when she was in the ward. So you know, we tried to get back to normal life, but what's normal when you have a sick baby in the hospital and you're at home alone because your husband's taking care of your sick baby? So, um, but it was good, you know, and my siblings got to take their turn to um, take care of her. My mom and my mother-in-law got to take care of her in the hospital. And it was just like, one day, and it's, it's insane. Like, I don't know, like, she is amazing. She is a little miracle, all, all on her own, but she's also so brave and so defiant because she really hated that CPAP machine. And after a while, the doctors started noticing that she really hated the CPAP machine. So they took the CPAP machine off and they wanted to try and give her, because like they noticed that she was doing better, so they wanted to give her, like, you know, the little oxygen things down here. I think she had it on for, like, a week a day because uh, she kept pulling it off so the doctors were like you know what she hates it so much let's just not do it to her and we'll see how it goes and she did fine like her oxygen stats were good the whole time um like she did have to have it back on for a little bit when like she had a little bit of a cold but uh, like that only lasted like 12 hours and then after that she never needed help with that and then her like soon after, they took the machine, the heart rate and oxygen rate machine off of her completely. They were like, she doesn't need this anymore, she's fine. Like, we're just working towards getting her weight up now, and we're just working towards getting her liver functions and kidney functions lower. Because at that, this point, they were great. They were good. They were, like, compared to where she was at first, beautiful numbers. So they just wanted to keep it going lower. You know, but then suddenly one day, because so I thought mm, in November, I think, um, no, September, October, November, yeah. Uh, so, I just completely forgot numbers. So, November, she started asking, uh, the doctors were like, yeah, I think she can go home soon. I was like, okay, cool, that's great. So I wanted her to be able to go home without her feeding machine, her profusion machine. But I think I, after a while, I was like, you know what, I'm not going to rush her just so she can get out of the hospital. Let's get out of the hospital and we can work together on this. And the doctor said, 
like suddenly one day the doctors were like, so um, what do you think about her going back tomorrow? I was like, what? He was like, yeah, so I, we think she's okay to go home tomorrow. And I was like, are you serious? And they're like, yeah, so if you're okay with that, we'll work towards it. I was like, yes, I'm very okay with that. Let's do tomorrow. So we decided that. I told everybody at home, told my family, everybody needed to take a RTK test to make sure they were COVID negative. And my husband was uh, also did one to make sure that he was negative. And then the next day, after like running around, trying, like, you know, her bills were so high, but we made a plan with the government, uh, government hospital, like how we can pay it and everything. And then we were talking about what we needed to do, what we needed, you know, what medication she needed, what time does she have it, like this, how you feed her and everything. And after all of that, like eight o'clock, I got to bring my baby home. <laughs> And everybody was there, like her cousins, her, her aunts, and my parents, like on my side. Everybody was there and they were so happy. And I was so happy. And I got to bring my baby home after that. And then uh, it was a great week, but she was already dealing with an infection. So she had to be uh, admitted again. But that was okay that was better because I knew it was only for a short amount of time and I we knew like why she was admitted and even then like she didn't stay as long as we thought she needed to because the doctors I swear the doctors are so kind to us and to her because I think even they understand that like you know it's been such a journey you know and all we want to do is be at home like with each other with our family and they were so sweet about it so yeah now, today, Dia is home. She's right outside, actually. I don't know about... You know, I'm still very protective of her. I don't know if I want to show her or whatever, but... I'm just so grateful. And I'm sorry it took me so long to tell you this story. It's like six months of trying to put the words in my head, and I wasn't even sure like what to say. Like At first, I thought I knew what I wanted to say, but now I have no idea and I've completely forgotten what I did actually want to say but I'd just like to say thank you to the doctors and nurses to everybody who was there for us to anyone who reached out to me and gave me like words of encouragement love kindness I think it's like it all all together really buoyed us you know it really like brought us together and it gave us so much strength and I'm so grateful to everybody I'm so grateful to God for my baby um, I'm grateful to my baby I'm like thank you Adia every day so every day now I say thank you Adia I'm so proud of you baby you're doing such a good job you're doing the best job ever I believe in you Adia there's nobody else in the world I believe in I believe in you and I trust you I trust you, baby, and I know that you make good decisions. Because, oh my God, I don't, do you make good decisions? Um, so yeah, I hope, I don't know, I hope this video was alright. Um, if you guys have any questions, I know I did a QA and a recently, so maybe I'll answer that in another video. This is not going to be like uh, a thing, it's going to be kind of sporadic because I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm just sharing this because I would like somebody else to know um, what happened to me so they can understand it or if they need like because this is something that I needed I just needed to see that somebody else went through this too um, so if you need you know if you want to ever talk you can reach me on my Instagram or my Twitter I'm pretty open there um, also I keep forgetting this part recently before she was um, discharged for the first time the doctors did inform me that <coughs> what she what happened to her what she had they can't actually call it neonatal hemochromatosis so they don't actually know what happened to her and we still don't have a diagnosis uh, we did send her blood and my blood and my husband's blood for um, genetic testing so we'll 
we're still waiting on the results from that so actually that's why it took me kind of long to do this video because I wasn't sure what diagnosis was like I didn't want to just like say things without knowing anything but hell that's been the last six months of my life so um, but yeah thank you everybody um, so if you do want to like keep up with Adia and I um, I am going to start a Patreon so I hope it's not too expensive if it is you can always just let me know or something I'm just trying to you know in one way uh, make money on the side so that I can take care of her at home but also I can take care of her and pay for her bills but also at the same time I am very protective of her and I don't want to just share anything out there to the public so I figure like a Patreon is like you know where I can keep it small and I can keep it curated and like you know people do pay for it but at least you know I'm open to conversations with the people there and it will keep it more centered for me at least because right now like my brains are all over the place like I thought I was going to be back at work by now I am not so I'm thinking maybe this Patreon thing will be good so I'm hoping that not hoping this is the plan uh, every month I'm going to do like a kind of blog post and these are love letters of mine to Adia kind of like to say thank you but kind of just to tell her that this is how I feel right now as a 28 year old woman and one day you'll be 28 because that is the plan that is the hope that one day Adia is 28 and she looks back and reads all this stuff and then every month I'm gonna just like you know do a little short vlog where it's just me and her, me and our little family, we're just hanging out and doing like little family things, capturing her milestones. Yeah, and it's just something that like hopefully sometime in the future she can refer to it and see like this is what she did. So like this video is that too. Because I realized that the minute I gave birth to her, the minute she the minute she started screaming her lungs out at the world all I ever talked to, the only person I ever talked to in my head, like I didn't even talk to myself, you know, usually you have a monologue or something, but mine was just always talking to her, and I think that's never going to change, and it's never going to go away, and yeah, I hope, I hope this video answered some of your questions, if you have any other questions, you can let me know. Um, if you want, maybe you can join my Patreon. It's I'll put the link down below. And if you don't want to, don't feel any pressure. You know, I'll still share some stuff about Adia. I think it's just like, it's more about her face, her, <laughs> her more personal journeys, my more personal journeys. I would like to keep that to a more curated group of people. But, you know, thank you for all your prayers. Thank you for all your love. I truly love you all so much and I really hope that you are, you know how much I love you guys and my heart my heart is always with you guys with mothers who have comp medically complex babies to have to mothers who have disabled babies like children and to mothers who have lost their children this is a sad and lonely and heartbreaking journey but I'm so glad that we have each other because really all I had at one point was you guys and I'm so grateful for it. I'm so so grateful for it. I can't stop saying it enough. Like Alhamdulillah. I always say Alhamdulillah Ya Allah Ya Tanku. Thank you for everyone, all these kind people you put on this earth. Because they are the quiet ones. But there's so many of them. And that's what this whole thing really taught me. It taught me one, I don't know anything, and two People are good, people are kind. And three, my daughter is a force to be reckoned with. So I love you guys. Thank you so much. Bye bye. I hope this wasn't too sad. I mean, I started crying. So, so, but thank you guys. I love you.